the dawn Our souls awake to you and lift a song We sing things that you have done and still we know the best is yet to come there's more to come open the gates and let your glory come down open our hearts and let our worship pour out let it pour out chains with sounds of victory you're changing everything open the gates and let your glory come down open our hearts and let our worship pour out open the gates and let Glory come down Open our hearts And let our worship pour out Let it pour out Come flood Flood this space No one else could take your place Come have your way No one else could take your place Come flood this space No one else could take your place Come have your way your place. Open the gates and let your glory come down. Open our hearts and let our worship pour out. Open the gates and let your glory come down. Open our hearts and let our worship Lord Jesus, we just want to lift you up. We just want to cling to the promise and the truth that you make a way for us. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you. I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I 
worship you. I worship you. You are rainmaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. Yeah, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. That's right. I worship you.
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. You make a way. You love us so. We trust in you, yeah. Lord, you make a way. You have great things ahead for each of us, God. Help us to trust and put our faith in you as you usher us in to this year. We are new creations in you. We trust in you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's continue with our online service. Amen. Hey, if we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Odalis. I'm part of the pastoral team here at Cornerstone SF. Happy New Year. We're saying it a lot. We'll probably say it for a couple more weeks, but it's an opportunity we have to step with intention forward into this year together. And I know we're so excited to get to share in it with this beautiful community that God has blessed us with here in SF and beyond from wherever you're tuning in. A couple of reminders as we're getting our year started together. On January 14th, we're having a baptism class. We're gonna do it online on Zoom, so super easy to connect and jump in. It's gonna be taught by Dr. Jeff Louie, who many of us know. He shares wonderful sermons here a couple times a year, and he has such a beautiful perspective on baptism, so much experience to share. And so would love to see you jump in on that. If you haven't been baptized, maybe you just have some questions about it or wanna listen. Um, there's no commitment that's required in order to participate in the class. Please register online. If you have any questions, let me know. Would love to dialogue with you on that. Then the following week on January 21st, we're throwing our first party of the year. We're having our New Year's celebration at our Reardon campus. This is a great day to invite friends, family, coworkers, neighbors to church, because we will have our church service at 10 o'clock and we have our big party out on the street start around 1130. Food trucks, music, activities for the kids, Mr. Softy will be there. So I'd love to see you there. Maybe you primarily join Cornerstone online as your primary church experience. I would love to personally invite you to join us in person that day too. It would be great to see your face. For all that and more about what's going on, you can always check our website, cornerstoneassets.org slash events, and be sure to sign up for the newsletter too. That's the best way to stay up to date for everything that's coming ahead. In a moment, we'll have Pastor Terry kicking off our New Year's series, The Faith Code. But before he does that, I'd love to pause, primarily for those who call Cornerstone their home church, for our time of giving. It's our time of giving our tithes and our offerings to the Lord, the giver of all good gifts. And we get to express our gratitude um, by practicing tithing. So you can give online through the app uh, or you can mail in a check as well. But as Pastor Cherry always says, the first thing the Lord wants from us is our hearts and everything an outflow from there. Uh, I would love to pray before Pastor Terry takes over for the message. Would you join me in that? Lord God, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity of each new day. Uh, Lord, and as much as we're hearing about a new year, as much as it's still on our minds, maybe some of us still pursuing some resolutions, at the end of the day, it's each moment is an opportunity to pursue you. Each moment is an invitation from you to walk with you in this journey of life. Lord, so we wanna do just that in this time that we're sharing together. As we receive this message, Lord, would you give us open ears and open mind and open heart to hear and understand and obey what it is you're instructing us in, Lord. Quiet the noise around us, quiet even the noise in our own minds so that we can receive from you together this day. We thank you for this opportunity we have to be gathered here. Thank you for gathering us from wherever it is we're coming for that we get to share in this time together. We love you, Lord, and we commit this time to you. It's in your beautiful name, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, let's receive this message now together. Life is heavy. Life is ever-changing. If only for these reasons, we can't build the life we desire without establishing it with something solid. 
and we will never realize our full potential if we don't work hard on keeping that foundation strong. In Silicon Valley, entire worlds are built from software code. As products develop, we recognize there is good code and bad code. Code that makes things work and code that makes things break or crash. There is operating code for things like computers, phones, tablets, and there are applications that run on that foundational code. The better the foundational code is, the better the apps run. But the most important code lives even deeper. What is often referred to as source code. Source code is a structural code upon which everything else is built. It creates the framework upon which devices function and applications run. It is lifeblood. And it is language. For any program to do a new thing, it needs to be recoded. Have something rewritten or added to the code it once lived by before. So what is our ultimate source code? Or to bring it out of Silicon Valley and into our daily lives, what is the right framework for living an authentic life of meaning and impact? All right, what a blessing to be able to share this time together with all of you. Like I say, my friends, near and far, wherever you are, some of you online right now for the very first time. And I'm so glad you're with us. I'm Pastor Terry Lee, pastor here at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco. You know, we are starting a new series. It's the Faith Code. Super excited about it. It really has to do with not only a book that we wrote, um, but, re but at its core, it, it's about how we can grow together and build a life of impact and meaning. And I'm just looking forward to this journey. These next few weeks, these next few months are gonna lead us right into Easter. And I'm so looking forward again to being a part of the expansion of your spiritual life with the Lord. And even now, Lord Jesus, we welcome you into this teaching. We welcome you into this place. We welcome you into this time. We want your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding to impact our lives so that we might live it better for you. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. You know, I just want to start by jumping right into the scripture, Colossians 2. We are reminded by the Apostle Paul who writes, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Now, the obvious starting point, and I don't want to assume that we're all, you know, at the same, same place here. I mean, some of us may not have done this yet. One of the things we're being reminded of is that the first thing we need to decide is what are we going to do with Jesus? Are we going to accept him as our Savior? Have we accepted Christ Jesus as our Lord? If you haven't done this, maybe you're really close. Maybe you've been thinking about it. Now is the time. It's as simple as saying, Lord, I just want you to be my Savior and Lord. I want you to be the guide of my life. And if you haven't been baptized, we want to assist you in that. Baptism is such an important step for every believer. It's one of the things Jesus invited us to do as a way of identifying ourselves with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's almost like we are saying, I am yours to the people who are there to support us when we go into those waters of baptism. Again, this is about a starting place. You know, I still remember, well, many years ago now, when I was a teenager, yeah, long time ago, <laughs> I remember when I really opened up my heart to Jesus, when I felt for the first time his presence, his spirit at work in my life, but I made a decision to follow him, a decision to commit my life to him. I confessed him as my Savior and Lord. And over the years, if I'm honest, well, I haven't always lived up to that confession, but neither have I abandoned it. In a lot of ways, I, I find myself relating to Peter. Peter, who loved the Lord, but at some at times he just let him down. 
But I remember there was this one moment when Peter was asked by Jesus, well, all the disciples were, when Jesus says, because people were leaving Jesus because he was saying hard things, hard truths, just like sometimes people today struggle over the hard truths of Jesus. The easy things or the things that we like, that's not offensive. But every now and then Jesus is going to say something that goes against the grain of what we want or what prevailing culture is teaching us. And in those moments, we have to decide. And Jesus asked this question to the disciples, will you also go away? Because everybody was leaving him. And that's when Peter stepped up and he said, Lord, where are we going to go? In fact, let me read it to you. John 6 says, after this, many of his disciples turned back. They no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I love Peter's confession. It's such a, a statement of his love for the Lord and again, Following Jesus doesn't mean being perfect, but we got to start, right? And I, if I can go back to that, that verse in Colossians 2, because look what it says. It says, not only just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, but then it goes on to say, you must continue to follow him. You must continue to follow him. So decision one, accept him as your Savior and Lord. Welcome Jesus into your heart. That's what we all must do. For by grace we have been saved through faith, that out of ourselves, it is the gift of God, right? This is the thing. But then after we make that decision, we have a second decision to make. And it's referred to right in this verse. We have to decide, are we going to continue to follow him? It's one thing to begin. It's another thing to continue. And that's something that we're going to have to also decide around. Am I going to go your way, Lord? Am I going to go the Jesus way as a way of life? So coming to Jesus is not a one and done. It's not just making a confession. It's a life of following and grounding our identity in him as a beloved son or daughter. A grand adventure of faith that's designed to give us life, shape our life, and bring us life now and forever. I just love that. I feel like I want to say that one more time. A grand adventure of faith that's designed to give us life, shape our life, and bring us life now and forever. Reading that verse and the one that follows, and now, just as you've accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Verse 7, and let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So stay with me now, but decision one, and these are both being described here in the sixth and seventh verses, just wonderfully. Decision one, accept him as our savior and Lord. Decision two, continue to follow him to go his way. Decision three, you see it. Contend for a life of spiritual depth and strength. Listen, not thin, not tepid, uh, not weak, but genuine, serious, intentional, and deep. That's what we're being invited into. You can see the progression here, opening up our hearts, making a decision to follow him, and then contending for the deeper life with him. We must commit ourselves to deep roots and strong foundations. It's the only way it really is going to work. And I really want to let those images speak. Like in your mind, think about it, because it's a perfect analogy of the Christian life. It's just deep roots, strong foundations. Uh, something more than a surface level faith and a foundation that's built on Jesus. And this, of course, when you think of these, these two things, um, this idea of depth, this idea of foundations, it actually does bring us back to the parable of the house that's built on the rock, doesn't it? Yeah. 
when Jesus said, if you hear these words of mine and do them. So Jesus talked about hearing and doing as a way of building that foundation. Uh, and before, before I can do, I must hear. I must truly believe and embrace at the core of my being. And that, again, this idea of confessing the Lord and making a decision to follow him. And it's, it's something that also invites us into a deeper understanding of his words. That's why anyone who's serious about following Jesus is going to also commit themselves to studying his words. And if I can say it this way, it's not optional. I mean, Jesus says, search the scriptures, for they testify of me. I mean, I, can, I cannot do what I do not know. And we are living in a, a, a culture, a world, um, at a time where there's a lot of spiritual ignorance or biblical ignorance or uh, even, and I'm, I'm even among those who claim to love Jesus, and I'm not even questioning that love. Uh, even those who've made a, a decision to accept Jesus as their Savior and uh, have made a decision to follow him and, and want to continue to live a life that honors him. But a lot of times we are not familiarizing ourselves with his words in the ways that we should. His words are life. His words are critical for discerning what is happening around us. And, you know, in the Old, in the Old Testament, for example, which a lot of times some people don't think of as being part of the Bible. You know, I, I've heard people say, well, I, I just like reading the words of Jesus. Hey, look, I like reading the words of Jesus too. I'm totally committed to, to the words of Jesus. <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> and the epistles and the New Testament, um, just all the scriptures that we are invited to enjoy, no question, great value and meaning that is uniquely connected to the New Testament because it starts with Jesus and then it builds its way out. And we should be studying the New Testament all the time and certainly the life of Christ. But the, <laughs> but the Older Testament, which was the Bible that Jesus quoted from, like Jesus was the living word and his words were scripture, if you will. But he also quoted from the scripture and the scripture he quoted from as the word of God was the Older Testament. So we really are invited and encouraged to have, if we're serious about following the Lord in a deeper faith and a life with him, if we really want a strong foundation, we're gonna to need to, to both hear and do, to be able to hear and do, we're gonna need his words. We need to hear his words, we need to study them. We're gonna be need to be familiar with them. We're gonna to need to have them deeply planted into our hearts and minds. And we're gonna to have to repeat that as a way of making sure that it is staying at the for, forefront. Uh, the, in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6, and I was reading this because Israel was told that a key to their generational faith survival in the midst of a spiritually aggressive and hostile culture was to Stay deeply connected to God's word, almost, I know this is, almost to a point of excess. He said, whatever happens to you, keep my words around you all the time. No matter where you are, keep my words near you. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 8. Hear, O Israel, listen to me. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love uh, the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. Jesus specifically quotes this and tells us this is the greatest thing we can ever do. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently, look at that, to your children. That's important, especially for those of us who are parents, grandparents, in some cases even great-grandparents, parental figures that we have influence, we be aunties and uncles. We may have the ability to affect people's lives, little ones for the Lord, but we're told we need to talk about and teach them diligently these words to our children. 
This is no small thing. That is, we are to repeat them again and again and again and again to our children. That's what we're being told. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Look at that. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. I mean, that's someone said, that's all the time. Basically, yes. <laughs> it's like all the time, his words are to be near to us. When you're in your house sitting, when you're walking by the way, just living life outside, when you lie down, when you get ready to go to sleep, and when you rise again, let his words be near. He goes on to, they, goes on to say, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. Some people took that literally in Jesus' day. But the whole idea was to make sure that, that you're able to see them and you're always aware of God's word. It's one of the reasons why I do like, you know, and I have God's word on my, you know, I have a Bible app. I have a, the Bible on my Kindle. But I also have a hard copy as well. Like, I like to go old school. It just seems something about that and just being able to turn the page and look at God's word and carry it with me. I like that. Uh, so it's, it's not a one or the other, it's a both and kind of thing. And look what the writer goes on to say, you shall write them on the doorposts. This is basically the Lord speaking to us. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is, is like a comprehensive just immersion with God's word, just surrounding our life. I think that is what we are being told. <laughs> And how much more important is it now when we are living in the midst of a culture that is not familiar with God's words, that is not allowing them to be taught? Uh, we need to teach them. We need to talk about them. We need them everywhere. And this is, this is again, why sometimes it's even valuable to post his words, uh, have little you know, pictures or writings or just have his word around our house as a way of immersing ourselves and reminding ourselves of God's word. Now I know it, it, it can go a little overboard sometimes and uh, could even seem, I don't know, just like a, <laughs> just an unnecessary, but I, I do think it's a wise practice. I do. I love the idea of a photo with some scripture or a little saying that we have that we can look at. My wife likes to write a verse sometimes out and just post it there for us to see. And, um, uh, I think it's important. We talk about them all the time with our kids and our little ones. One of the values of bringing your kids to children's church is that then it gives you something to talk about in the rest of the week or when you come home and you can get into what they learned. And it's just huge, right? It's a value. But we keep his words on our lips. We, we post visual expressions. And also, I'll, I'll throw in one more thing, and pray over our meals. Um, I, I just think if we begin to build a life where his words and prayers are integrated as something normative, it's going to be huge. So again, if I can go, so again, going back to what Jesus taught us. So he said, if you hear these words of mine, you immerse yourself in them and then do them. Hearing and doing. Before I can do, I must hear. We all get that. I, I can't do what I don't know. I have to familiarize myself with his words. But remember this, hearing is not the goal. The goal is doing. It's hear and do these sayings of mine. That's what Jesus taught us. The goal, loved ones, the goal is implementation. It's activation. It's making those words work in our lives. It's not just having the words in our lives. It's putting those words into practice in our lives. Now, the likelihood of us practicing those words is certainly enhanced if we're immersing ourselves in those words. And I'll never be able to do what I do not know. So that is implied as well. But what we're really talking about here is a fully functioning faith that is durable, sustainable, highly adaptive, and capable of compounding, a fully functioning faith that is durable and sustainable. It can, it can take stuff. It can go through hard times. It may even grow in adversity, highly adaptive. Every situation I've learned to be content, the apostle Paul says, extraordinarily adaptive. I know how to bound. I know how to be abased. 
some of us are better at one than the other. I like to think that I'm better at a bounding. <laughs> if I had my preference, I'd rather be tested on a bounding <laughs> than being abased. But, you know, or suffering. I don't really want to suffer. I'd rather be happy and, and have everything going my way. It's true. I'm just being honest. But at the same time, a lot of growth happens when, when we are having to endure pain and, and having to walk through hardship because it strips away the veneer and makes us trust God better. Like I, I, I have to really put my faith in action in the hard times in ways that sometimes in the easier times is not as necessary. In fact, sometimes prosperity and good seasons become times of complacency when it's easy to forget God and think that maybe I really don't need him as much as I thought I did. And, but the point being, we are contending for a faith that is not just durable, sustainable, but it's highly adaptive. It's capable of going through stuff. And um, it's also something that com is compounding. Ideally, we are growing, we are building. Um, our faith is enlarging. Our understanding is growing. It's true, sometimes it's hard to recapture our first love because there's something about that first exposure to the Lord, that first awakening, when my eyes are first open, that it's, it's hard to reproduce, but it can become a different, it's, it's a lot like being in love and then growing in love with, in my, like in my case, with my wife. It's different than when we first met, you know, 40 years, almost 40 years ago, but it's also more beautiful in a certain way because it has a richness to it and uh, memories and we've built things together. And so it is with our walk with the Lord. It can still be alive. If God has his way, it'll be very alive and it will have new things and it will compound in its impact. That's God's will. If I can go back again to Colossians 2, Read it through one more time. Let your roots grow down into him. That's verse seven. And let your lives be built on him. So we're talking about the growing life, having a life of meaning and impact. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? These are, see, these are critical pieces to the resilient, thriving faith life. One, we are, con we are, encouraged to cultivate a growing edge. There's no question about it. To sign on with Jesus is sign on for a life of growth. You know, let your roots grow down. But it's also to be alive, and, and we shouldn't miss this because it's attached to the end of that verse. Notice the word thankfulness. It's to be a life of gratitude that is overflowing in thankfulness, not just for today or yesterday's blessings, which would be enough, but also for all the good and the blessing, which by the way is the direct context of the verse, that is yet to come because of the choices we are make, making to grow deeper in him. And then the apostle says this, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense, <laughs> I'm reading from the NLT here, that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. Remember. If we don't stand for something, we will fall for anything. We are to be strong in the faith, discerning the times and capable of standing against, yeah, I'm just gonna say it, the lies of the evil one and dominant wayward culture. We are to have a foundation that is sure in Christ a mooring point that keeps us from drift. And listen, deception, that's what we were just reading. So hear me out, if I can say it in a different way, I would say it this way. Are you ready? Because here it is. Jesus is to be both our cornerstone, which I love because that's the namesake of our church, and Jesus is the cornerstone, Ephesians 2. But Jesus is to be both our cornerstone, our foundation, we're talking about foundations, and our touchstone. And I don't think I've ever really said it that way before. He used to be both our cornerstone and our touchstone. And what is a touchstone? But the standard by which things are measured, a criterion, a gauge, a standard, a yardstick. That's what Webster's, Merriam-Webster 
tells us, a test, a criterion for determining the quality or the genuineness of a thing. Touchstone, as it is defined today, I did some research on this, comes from an actual stone. In the late 15th century, gold and silver was rubbed or touched against black quartz, the touchstone. It was scraped in such a way to determine the purity of the metals. This was done by looking at the color of the streaks that were left on the stone. So they were able to tell by using the touchstone the genuineness and the authenticity of a metal. And uh, the, I was reading some more that the method is accurate enough in the case of determining the purity of gold that is still in use today. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's like, you know, 500 years ago. Figurative use uh, extended from the literal use with touchstone functioning as a word for a test or criterion to determine the quality of a thing and later to refer to a fundamental or quintessential part or feature of something. So the touchstone allows for us to understand the authenticity of something. It gives us a standard, a way of ascertaining whether something is what it appears to be. And so I need to, do you see the connection? I need to use the words of the scripture and the words of Jesus as my standard for worldview. Um, I, I need to use his life and the, and the life that is modeled in the scripture as an example for how I am to live my life and how we are to live our lives. Do you see that? And so that we can understand also what our identity? I mean, there's so much talk about identity now. Where do we find our identity? What is the touchstone? Is it how I feel about myself or is it what God says in his word? Is it what Jesus taught us or what our culture tells us? Where is true identity found? So the same way in which my worldview is to be determined, right? Not by what I hear around me, but by the touchstone of Christ. In the same way, I am to let that also determine my identity for my first identity is to be as a son or daughter in Christ and work from that. And once that is the case, then everything is on the table, right? And then also letting the words of Jesus and the life that he modeled be the touchstone for what love is. So if, because <laughs> there's a lot of people saying this is what love is, but we are to go by what the scriptures and Jesus and what God says love is. I mean, God is love. Jesus was love modeled. And he shows us that love is full of grace and truth, not one to the exclusion of the other. And how is that truth defined? By what Jesus taught us in his word, these words of mine. There is a quote that um, we refer to in chapter one of of the book, The Faith Code. It's the book that we're basing the series on that was written by myself and uh, co-author Rusty Roof, who will be sharing in a couple of weeks, actually. But uh, the quote that I refer to, we refer to is from an ancient Greek mathematician, engineer, a man named Archimedes. And Archimedes said this, wrote this. He said, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. Give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. A place to stand, what does that speak of? Uh, a sure foundation, do you see the connection? And a lever long enough, we're talking about the tools to amplify our efforts. And that's really what this series, and yeah, our book is about, a place to stand. What we're trying to talk about here is a framework or another phrase we use or a little two words that we use, a source code, a source code. And what we say that is, is what Jesus taught us, these sayings of mine, right? That becomes our primary foundation point, that becomes our cornerstone, that becomes our touchstone. And then building and working the framework, that is testing and applying it. And that's, that's actually how we section it by, and that's how we amplify our efforts as well, by applying the principles that Jesus gave us, the scriptures give us, to every aspect of our life. So I get my foundation secure, I have my touchstone clear, 
And then I can amplify that out by applying the principles and teachings and words of Christ to the aspects of my life. And so as we start to live it out, and, and, and uh, my co-author Rusty does such a great job talking about how that applies to the workplace. But this, of course, reminds us of something that Jesus said specifically in Matthew 17. I want to have us look at this as well. For Jesus said, just thinking about, again, a place to stand and a lever long enough, you can move the world. But look at what Jesus said. He said, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. And then Jesus said, nothing will be impossible to you. Like, don't underestimate the power of what faith can do, what can be moved. So just like in the tech world, we start with the source code, the structural code on which everything else is built. It creates a framework or a foundational code. The skeleton, by the way, on which our devices, you know, our phones function and the applications run, the more elegant they say the source code, the better the applications run. The faith code that Jesus gave us, that is the ultimate source code on which a truly meaningful life is built. And it works. So what I'm saying is we get the cornerstone and the touchstone in place, and then we build off of that. And that's the kind of life that's going to stand. And honestly, it's future-proof. That is, it will echo into eternity. And it will live far beyond our lifetime in the lives of other people. It, all the generations yet to come should the Lord tarry that will be affected by the good that we are welcoming into our life because we have made a decision to build on Christ. So heading into this new year, just real quick, let's talk about what that's gonna look like. Let me start by saying that this really is an inside job. That, you know, that's a, it's our, our place to stand. We start by securing Again, this identity of who we really are and um, as a son, as a daughter and I, of Christ. And I, I work that into my character development and my faith sustainability. So it, it, it starts internally. Like that's what we're contending for. And so as we, we, we really want to go at the internal. We start there. We make sure that our foundations are secure. We make sure that his word is abiding in our hearts and in our lives. And we just, we're just really devoted. And then if I can think, say it in a slightly different way. So once we have this internal work being done, then we begin to start to think about, Lord, what things do you want us to move? And so I look at that by going, well, you know, because in Jesus' case, you know, that's the, you know, and it's the lever or what Jesus talked about is the you know, faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed that can move a mountain. And I, I was thinking, Lord, what, what are, as we make our win in the new year, what are attitudes and habits hmm, that he may want us to let go of, right? If, if, if He wants us to move them, he wants us to move them out, let them go. And then if I can say it this way, we move that out so that we can move some other things in. How are we to apply and build out? How are we to um, not just excavate and clear out certain things, but also begin to build on the foundation? And we're talking about a life of faith exploration, of, of growing something, of, of building something. Because remember, our goal is not just to survive. We can survive with a foundation, but our goal is to thrive. It's not just hearing, it's doing. And it's a certain kind of doing that is connected to being who he has created us to be. And out of that flows a life of vibrancy, a life of expansion, a life of influence, and a life that affects others for good. Not the perfect, we're not perfect. No, none of us are perfect. We're never gonna get this fully right. There are going to be times when we struggle and stumble. I get all that. Uh, I've disappointed God more than I can ever imagine and count. And yet I know, I remember going back to Peter, but I love him. And I know you do too. And he invites us into a life that is, yeah, not just surviving, it's thriving. It's building on the foundation. 
It's evaluating on the basis of the touchstone and it's amplifying that into every corner of our lives in such a way that it's making a difference. So let's think about that. I'm gonna come back around. I've got some final thoughts to share. Uh, but now let's share this song that's connected to what I just said about not just surviving, but thriving. Been fighting things that I can't see in Like voices come from the inside of me in Like doing things I find hard to believe in Am I myself or am I dreaming? I've been awake for an hour or so Checking for a pulse but I just don't know Am I a man when I feel like a ghost? The stranger in the mirror is wearing my clothes No, I'm not alright I know that I'm not right Thrive, not just survive. I want to. Th- 
Uh, Lord, you are so good. <laughs> Your goodness is overwhelming. And I know you invite us as we are making our way, you know, past this first week of the new year, you're inviting us to thrive, to grow. You're inviting us to build and you're inviting us to contend. And a lot of times, Lord, we confess to you that that's an aspiration we have, but we're, we're not really giving attention to the details. And so what would that look like? What would it look like to build out a certain room? What kind of room is the Lord wanting us to build? Are there certain habits that the Lord is wanting us to contend and implement? Are there certain things that God's wanting us to give more attention to, like the reading of his word? Some of us, it may be journaling. Some of us, it may be um, more devoted in uh, just having a little more time of prayer or having some prayer walk time, but we're trying to be consistent. We're trying to build. Uh, for others of us, it's just, again, gaining that familiarity or refamiliarity with his words so that they're very alive in us. We're posting them in different places. We're, we're re-engaging them, even in ways that might seem, for some people, a little bit silly, but they make a difference. So whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would give us expansion in our hearts. Keep us running. Keep us on the go. Keep us moving and keep us growing on the go and on the grow in Jesus' name.